Ladies and gentlemen, we like to welcome you out to this show tonight. We are now in Houston, sold out arena. Oh, uh, what about that hit? A big pop is Alan Irvin. Got welcomed by Roderick like Johnson. From Oklahoma State. We saw him on the blitz earlier. That was cool. That did not feel good. Yeah, that's why it's hard to run about the out. You can hear that from up here. And I've been winning in our four minutes. Listen to the crowds. You hear what they saying? They on their feet getting crunk because they see me playing. Kids say I'm the man. Thugs love my style. I keep the street with the braids and the diamond smile. I'm the star of the team. I'm a Coach Rodman Johnson, a.k.a. Rob, Rob straight out of Galveston, Texas, G County representative. What's going on, player? What's going down, baby? So, you know, the number one motto of Thursday Thursday is we going to talk about it. You know what I'm saying? And I and I put the I put it up, and, uh, and we're going to work our way to the end of that story when we said, uh, uh, it would say NFL or college degree. He had to choose. And we're going to work our way on into that. So, uh, man, how everything going, man? How you doing with this corona shit? Oh, man, quarantine myself, man. I got to make sure I'm staying healthy. Yeah, ain't nothing wrong with that, play. Ain't nothing wrong with that. So, uh, are y'all, and the reason why, you know, this was supposed to be a live and in-person interview, but due to the quarantine, we are in, you know, separate locations. But we will deliver. As always, we will make sure that we bring it to you on time and how it's supposed to go. And we want to get this out, you know, especially while everybody's sitting on their ass, you know, trying to figure it out. But it's Thursday, Thursday. And, you know, I'm participating. Cheers to you. Sponsored by Hennessy, one of the world's finest. So we're going to jump right into it. For the people who don't know you from jack shit, you know, and falling out the sky. Where are you from? From that island, man. This is where, where, where you go down there. Galveston, Texas, man. All right. Well, so what do you love best about growing up in Galveston? Now, a lot of people, they see how island proud we are with this little bitty island. How, what, 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 what did you love about being raised uh, in Galveston, Texas? My community. You know, uh, from, from the person next door to the person down the street, everybody was looking out for you. Man, just the community around you, the support you have around you, the people that you know, the people that you love, and that feel of Galveston, Texas. Most people don't understand what I say, the feel of it, but when you go to Galveston, it's a feeling you get from being there that, that's just enticing to you. So, I mean, I, my, my memories from the island and, and growing up on the island, just, you know, being able to ride my bike freely up and down that beach in the seawall and just, you know, be a kid. So, all those memories growing up in that island is what made me me. It must be the salt in the what? The water. <laughs> Talk to him, baby. <laughs> so, this, can you describe the time period and uh, the environment uh, of Galveston at the time, you know, when you were growing up, coming up as a young, what, what was the climate like in Galveston? We ain't talking about the weather. We knew it was hot than a motherfucker, but because <laughs> people want to know what make us like we are, you know, so... Just well, talk to him about it. Uh, I've seen a lot of things in Galveston, man, from good and bad. You know, I, I want to talk from the perspective of good. You know, all the love, all the all the family, all the all the support from friends and the people that you be around. You know, just it's a, it's a mass support from the island. But then, you know, growing up on the island, you got to see a lot of the the gang activity. You got to see a lot of the the things that. You know, most people want to block their kids from seeing, you know, but growing up on the island, that's what made you out of tough because you knew exactly what to what to expect from certain people and you knew how to protect yourself at the same time. So most people don't understand what the attitude is about when, when they meet a person from Galveston, how the swag is from Galveston, but that's what give it to you, the drip, the swag, you know, just being raised in them, them trenches. You can't show us nothing. We didn't seen it already, man. I'm telling you, man. I see it right there. Hey. 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 Ain't nothing wrong with that, man. So, so what made you get into sports, and what was the what was the first sport you got into? Well, man, we get into sports, man. I was bad as hell. <laughs> yeah, you were bad. It's, it's, it's school, yeah, you know, it's school. So, you know, not not you know, disrespectful, bad, but I had a lot of energy. I like to play. I like to have fun. So, a little ADHD. A little bit, you know. And most people think that's a, uh, a type of disorder or whatever, but I just call it your life, man. That's, you, that's who you are. I mean, you got a lot of energy, you got a lot of passion for what you do. So my mom, one, one day she she got a phone call from a teacher at home, and 
and she was just done with it. So uh, I got to give a shout out to Melvin Bolden. Melvin Bolden was the first person to come to me and was like, I'm going to take care of him. I got him. Anything he do, anything going on to school, Miss Johnson, I got him. So he put me in sports. And, you know, from that moment, although I did play little league football for the Patriots, you know, I wasn't as, it wasn't as serious and as tense as it got to where I was in middle school. So at that moment, I had to grow up a little bit and make some different decisions. And I hated football. Football was not my sport. You know, it just wasn't what I You were more of a basketball player, huh? You, you, I was a hooper. Yeah. I, I was a hooper, man. You know, football, you had to get sweaty and dirty, jump, dive in the grass. I went about that life, man. I was, I was more... You know, I want to shoot these threes, and I want to look pretty doing what I'm doing. This a middle linebacker saying he didn't want to get dirty. <laughs> you know, that's a young middle linebacker saying that, though. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when you get in that in that world where testosterone is, is a big part, you know, and, and, and manhood comes into play, and you don't want to be embarrassed, stuff like that, you got something to prove. Right. So, uh, you, we got this thing that we had bull in the ring. So it's illegal now, y'all. We don't do it no yeah, more. Yeah, yeah. We, don't, we, don't do, we can't do that no more. <laughs> it, made, it ran a lot of people out of football, I'm going to tell you that. Uh, it, it made you wonder if this is what people Yeah, are. yeah. But, you know, you put everybody around and you just got to get in that mode where you're trying to hurt everything that's coming at you. So when I got in the middle of the ring and everybody's coming at me, I feel like I had to defend myself, and that's exactly what I did. And from there, I knew I can do that sport, so I stuck with it. Right, right, right. So, uh, so you you swung more towards basketball. How how long did you play basketball and football? I played basketball all the way up. Well, I've been playing basketball all my life. I played AAU basketball. So who would you play for AAU? Oh, uh, the Ballers with. Uh, I played with the Ballers and I played with uh, the Katy Mustangs. But Galveston Ballers was the team that I that I stuck with with, uh, with Coach Stevens. You know, Coach Stevens was the guy in Galveston, Texas, when it came to basketball. Him and Featherway. You know, it was just putting the best teams together that they had on the island. Wasn't enough space on one team for everybody that could hoop on the island, so they had to have multiple teams. So right. we just went with that. I started that, man, in middle school, you know, and, and stuck with it. And all the way up until the 10th grade, you know, 10th grade, you know, scholarships came in. I had, I had to make a decision, you know, what I wanted to put the rest of my energy into, and I, I decided that it was going to be football. Although I had basketball scholarships, many people don't know that. You know, Stephen F. Austin, Texas A&M, at that time period, you know, was actually looking at me as a sophomore going into my 11th grade year. But you go to football and you get Florida, and you get Texas, LSU, you get Ohio State, you get things like that. It's like, okay, well, this is a no-brainer. Right, right. So, so I don't even want to go too far yet. So, but in middle school, what positions did you play in football in junior high? Where you went to, Wise? Yeah, with the Wise Middle School. Unfortunately. Huh? We, we told everybody up, baby. We won. In what? Uh, marbles? Football. When? Oh, we told everybody up. Boy, that's a whole nother conversation, stuff. man. It's a whole nother one, but hey, <laughs> you, uh, I want to look into this camera. You know who you are, and you know what team you played for, and you know what Wise did to y'all. That's all I'm going to say on now. But anyway, we can keep up with the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> they know who they are. I ain't got to bring them on names in that. They know what yeah. Wise did to them in that time period, so we just going to go with that. But... Yeah, man, wise out. So I, I claimed that. With, I claimed it with everything. So you made your name. Did you make a name for yourself in junior high? You had to, you had to reprove yourself when you got to high school. My name was made in middle school. You know, middle school. At middle playing school. what position? Quarterback. I played quarterback and I played safety. Ain't no, but uh, uh, we had technical difficulty. Boom, we back. Yeah. But we played, uh, I played quarterback, I played safety, but, you know, I was big, six foot one, six foot two, 200 pounds, and you couldn't tackle me, so that's a force to be reckoned with, so coaches from the, back then, they used to come watch the middle school games, they used to scout, so uh, Coach Tanier, he already knew the team, the, the people that he wanted from that team, coming from Wise and Central and Austin, so he kind of already had a clue about what he wanted to do, I remember seeing him at our middle school games, they, had, they used to have that tower, Right. Yeah, in, yeah, that, yeah. That's that eye in the sky. It don't lie. Get that red yeah, beam put on your ass. <laughs> yeah, he'll stand up there at that tower and just watch everything. So, you know, the eye been on you for a while. You just wanted to kind of, you know, just put everything out there that you could because you knew the big, big ball man was watching up there. So. so, did you play your whole freshman year? I played every every game my freshman year. We lost your camera. Okay. My bad. 
You play you play uh every you played your whole entire freshman year on freshman. Yeah, yes I did. All the way up until uh, if we would have went to the playoffs, I would have been up for the playoffs. But uh, we lost that last game and we didn't go to playoffs my last uh, my freshman year. Still as a safety and a and a quarterback, right? Mm-hmm. Well, what, what a lot of people don't understand is back in the day in Galveston, everybody had two positions, and it wasn't no I only play wide receiver, I only play quarterback. It was if you play wide receiver, you play defensive back. If you play running back, you play linebacker. If you play quarterback, you play defensive back. You play O line, you play D line. It was that was I mean Although I went to college at middle linebacker, when I got the ball high, I played multiple positions. I played quarterback, I played receiver, I played tight end, I played safety, I played strong safety, I played middle linebacker. So I mean these are the things that they Asked them you to do in order for the team to be great. Because we just wanted to play football. Yes, I mean, as long as you ain't on the other side of that white line, I, whatever. I play wherever the hell you want me to play. Yeah, just tell me after. What, what as long as I'm not over there. To, what's crazy is that you didn't even have to, you didn't even have to practice that week. That if you're an athlete, they need you to do something athletic. Okay, this is what I need you to do. And they'll coach you right up there on the sideline, and then you put you in the game and see if you can do it. They put you in the trenches right in. So you're in the fire. And you ain't had no practice, so it teach you how to be built tough. I mean, it's just the way it was. You yeah, just throw your ass out there, man. So, so how does it feel? How did it feel when you first got on varsity? Like I remember, you know, that first experience when you first walk into that locker room. Well, you know, the, the locker room was filled with tradition. You know, you had the pictures of the eyes of the history of Galveston Ball High looking down on you. You know, and the walking there and. The carpet to the lockers to everything, the smell of the locker room. You know, you, you dream of being in that locker room. The smell? You dream of being in the, the, Remember that? The smell. Oh, y'all, y'all wouldn't have to wear jockey straps. We had to wear jockey straps. Football, man. Football, yeah, man. yeah. It was must wear his feet. It was football. Right, you know, right. That's what I people feel understand. You. See, a woman cannot step in the locker room and say, okay, this is football. She was like, ooh, this shit stank. Yeah. To me, I smell football. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Right, so, right. You know, and then the, the, the but the proudest moment, though, is my first game when, you, when I was finally able to put on my gold pants, man, with the stripe down the side. Yeah. Man, that made you feel right, like... Hey, looking back, though, them jerseys was ugly than a motherfucker, but boy, when you put that shit on... Hey. You look, you, you look at LSU on TV and then see, look at our jersey and be like... Yeah, we look like somebody, goddamn. Yeah, so, so, so you know. what was the moment, the, the ideal moment, it, it, I don't care if it was practice or at a game, when you made that impact... And they had to put some respect on your name. When they had to they had to say, okay, Roger Johnson, hey, he for real. He out here. <laughs> my, my sophomore year, we was, uh we had a scrimmage versus Deer Park. And uh I was playing quarterback. Well, it was more of a I played J V scrimmage and I played the varsity scrimmage. So I did good in the J V scrimmage, so they said, Okay, we're gonna play the varsity scrimmage too. So they threw me out there. At safety first, because we had a cold ass quarterback in Roshan, so he was running the offense. That just threw me out there at safety. And we were, I'm rotating in with uh, with Daryl Kitchen and stuff like that when we were back there. And uh, Deerport had this real big running back, number 44. I don't know what his name is, but I remember his size. He's about six foot two, a good about 230. And he was a running back. He was a running back. Yeah. A uh, big country fed dude, man. But I remember Coach Rollins, he said, Come. Coach Neely, I need him on defense. I mean, on offense right now. He said, nah, you can use him. He said, come on. He brought me over. He said, this is what I need you to do. They're going to run the ball. If he leak out anywhere, I just need you to run down here and fill the hole. Whatever hole to come out of. I said, yes, sir. So, Ryan threw me on the field. Like I said, ball high, they throw you in the fire, baby. You yeah. Ready. They give you one, two sentences, and then go on, go play. <laughs> I had no practice, no nothing at safety, man. He threw me out there, and luckily... Uh, the first two plays was, you know, like little sweet plays or whatever. So they had it contained or whatever. But that third play, I'll never forget. It was a dive play right up the middle. And I mean, the hole just opened up. It was just me and the running back. And I'm coming straight down here. He come down here. And I tattooed his ass. Okay. I dislocated his collarbone, broke his face mask. Was rather, right after the hit, I couldn't hear nothing. I couldn't hear nothing. My head was beaming. I just could That's called a concussion now. Now they call that a concussion. That's what, it's called, nah. <laughs> that, that what they call right. They call that a concussion right now. <laughs> but I just I just could hear I, I could see people by mouth moving all excited and stuff like that. And then when I finally got my hearing back, I heard Coach Riley say, 
He played defense now. Y'all ain't getting him back on the offense. And he just took me on defense. I've been playing defense the rest of my life. And you talk about Coach Rollins. That's James Rollins. Uh, and he's the uh, assistant head coach. Or I don't know. I don't know if he's still there, but the assistant head coach for U, uh, UTSA. Uh, and it's a lot of Coach Rollins coached at Galveston and at Lamar. He's the defense coordinator over there. He's the defensive coordinator and the, and the assistant head coach up there. Yes, he was. Yes. He yes. Was. So that, that, I mean, he, Coach Rollins coached me, and yeah, that's a Louisiana guy. I don't I don't remember what part of Louisiana we were from, but you know he had that boot in him, and that dude right there, he'll pump you up and make you want to run through a, a damn brick wall, you know. Yes, he was. So, uh, so, at what? Oh, I'm sorry. I just, so, uh, uh, the high school career. I remember uh, coming to one of y'all game. I think it was uh y'all wanted me to come to Houston Smiley or whatever. Who was the Green and Gold team? It was, it was Houston Worthing. That was Worthing, and I walked in there. And, like, I was there for maybe 10 minutes. And uh, I, the play to stick out of my head, first y'all was just demolishing him, right? Then I seen a play where, where Walter was on the D-line, and he did, a, a like, a slap move and slapped the guard into the center. And the center went into the other guard, and you just flew right through the A-gap and hit the quarterback. It looked like you blew through the fullback and the runner. I said, man, I'm not watching this shit, man. I'm <laughs> I said, man, I'm not coming to watch y'all games, man. Y'all doing that, man. Call me when y'all got a game game, man. I'm not. <laughs> people don't realize, man, when you got somebody like a Walter Thomas in front of you, for those of people that don't know Walter Thomas, six foot six by 360, okay? Right. Big athletic, okay? And we was you the 40 guy, time, about a 47, 48, 40? Uh, 48, 40. Yeah. If you got a guy like that that play in front of you that demands so much attention, then. And, a lot of things going to be spilled to you. They're going to run away from him or he's going to clear some stuff up for you to make some plays, and that's what he did. You know, and luckily I was the guy to make the play. But you right. can spill the things to a lot of guys and they ain't going to make the play, you know. So, and luckily I had some thump behind me when I came. So it was a good one-two combination. And, and being on a team like that with so many different athletes in so many different positions growing up, I just made a, first page, uh, a little post on Facebook about it. My sophomore year playing scout team got me ready to play football mm -hmm. because you had so many athletes just all over the field that demanded the attention, that demanded the, 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 the field, you know. It was hard to get on the field, so you had to play somewhere. And scout team is where I made a name, you know. I go out there knocking heads off and stuff like that. You get respect from the, from the older players, but you also had to earn it, you know. They weren't going right. to pay you nothing, you know. So, like, when you played, I remember being a freshman, <laughs> Y'all was sitting in the common area of Ball High. I'll never forget this. Y'all was in the common area of Ball High. And all, all the varsity players were standing together. And y'all was reading the paper about Roshan and his little article he had in the paper about Roshan. Roshan Pope. Yeah. And I walked over there and I tried to ease in on conversation and look at the paper. And I just remember, I don't know who, I can't remember who it was, Pines, Norris Pines or whoever that was. Say, man, if you don't get your little freshman ass on, man, you can't be in this circle, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and I look, I said, and that's when I knew it was a difference, you know. Hey, yeah. a different swag around here, bro. You you ain't top dog like you was in middle school. You got to earn your keep. Right. You got to go in there. You got to go bust some heads before you can even. You can't even eat lunch unless you're out there busting some heads. You can't sit with the cool guys unless you're whooping some ass out there, man. I remember y'all had the power raid machine in y'all locker room, man. At the practice, everybody want a parade, you know. So you try to convince a Boston player to get your parade out there, man. I almost got my ass whooped <laughs> trying to steal the parade out of there. Hey, I'm, I almost got my ass whooped going trying to get some uh, pink lemonade up out that damn Boston soda water oh, machine. Oh <laughs> man, that, that's just the wrong thing to do. Though, right, man. right. It's, it's so much tradition, so much history. Though, so, man. so how do you summarize like? I know it's hard to put all that all in a couple of sentences, but like your high school career, let's say from freshman to junior year. I, no, let, let's go sophomore and junior year. And I, that senior year is a whole nother conversation. It was a blur. I'm saying that right now. It was a blur. Not because of concussions or nothing, huh? No, no, no. Not because of concussions. <laughs> you have so much fun doing what you're doing, so much camaraderie on the team and so much passion for what you're doing that Every day you're going to practice, you're not realizing that this is one day marked off the, your time period for playing. Yeah, sports. yeah, you're playing your way up out of high school. Yeah, so, you know, uh, when, it, when it came down to it, at the end of it, and I'm, I'm realizing that, okay, well, the time is coming near, I'm graduating. I decided to graduate early. You know, right. Because, you know, I had the opportunity. 
So what, 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 what triggered that train of thought? Because, you know, back in the day, that wasn't even a thought in no athlete's brain. None. And I want to really go back and see how many athletes at that time and from Bio High even thought to graduate early. What triggered that train of thought to graduate early? And it's, and it's a lot of kids that need to hear that, to hear this right here, because I don't think they believe it's obtainable. I think they think it's like a unicorn. When it was presented to me, and that's this is why I tell people, good recruiting coaches are going to put you in the best position possible. Joe DeForest presented an opportunity. He said, man, I went over your transcripts. You have all the credits you need to graduate early. A guy that they recruited named Bobby Reed down at, at well, up in North Shore. Yeah, Bobby he Reed. Was doing the same, he was doing the same thing. And so it was a trend that they were trying to get started and getting these guys, you know, graduating and on the college, you know, started a little bit earlier than normal. So he looked at my, my transcript and said, man, all you got to do is take a, a economics class and a math class next semester and you should be good. And that's what I did. So I, we went to my council. We, we seen where, what I needed, what, what my credits was, and I was able to double block. And, you know, I had two major classes, and the rest of them was, you know, just elective classes. So I was able to graduate early that next semester. I didn't need any other, other classes. So... When that was presented to That me, came from you know. putting in the front end work freshman and yeah. sophomore year. Oh, yeah. And taking care of business, kids. Taking and care of know, business. They don't understand how important the freshman year is. Right. The freshman year sets your GPA. It's so much harder to work from behind and already set your stuff going forward. Say so that. Say for instance, if you make a 1.0 your freshman year, and you got three years left to try to get, get that thing back up if you're on a 4.0 scale, up to a 4.0. That probably won't happen. But if you set your GPA at a 4.0 your freshman year, it's harder to bring your GPA down because you have more collective data to add up to this sum of whatever number you got than it is to work without any numbers in there. So so kids kids don't understand how important that freshman year, that freshman year is. Well, that thing is you didn't understand it either. You had Miss Teresa is going to put that belt on you. No. If, yeah, I, had a, I had a mom in my house. You ain't have nobody to explain it to you. It was either you gonna do it or you gonna catch this raw end of this leather. And I had I had too much for, too much respect for my mama to, you know, come in that house and don't you know, don't do my schoolwork and things like that because that was the number one thing. Sports didn't matter to my mama. My mama wanted to make sure that I was doing right in school, doing right in the streets and and by people. And sports football just by, just so happened to help me with all those things that she was asking for me. You know, you learn so much from this sport. The the discipline, the respect aspect of it is just untouchable. And you you build relationships, you develop with people, you learn how to build teamwork. So many things that this sport builds that people don't really put an eye on that needs to be noticed or noticed more by people on the outside. Coaches, when they come into this sport, a coach don't come into the sport saying, I want to make a lot of money. That's not what a coach comes for. A coach coming to the sports trying to teach all the knowledge that he failed to realize when he was in that same position and try to pass his knowledge now forward. If you're in the coach and you're doing this for your own your own gain or your own good, you need to get out of the sport because you're not doing any good towards these kids. But if you start setting these kids up for what they need to know now and help them prevent the things that they're going to fail at later, we're going to have a much higher success rate in our community and our areas. Right, right. So so going back to you being a, 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 a basically you graduated in December, right? You and Ryan Reeves. Ryan Reeves won the athlete. Shout out to Mr. <laughs> Reeves. Uh-huh. Y'all both graduated, and di- y'all was the, the, the least celebrated early graduates ever, and none of us understood it. I was like, what the hell? I graduated. I was like, what? Get the fuck out of here. You must got all electives. No, you graduated, graduated. So now you're a high school senior on a college, Division One college campus. Yep. By yourself. Describe that. Not even a football, just walking on. You at Oklahoma State. I think it was uh, Les Miles, the, the Mad Hatter, was your coach, right? A mad, I mean, just explain that, that that whole experience. Well, you, you, you are a small fish in a big pond. Everybody is you. Everybody was a top athlete at their school. Everybody had all these accolades coming out of high school. Everybody did what you've done already, you know. So you were no different than the next person standing next to you. Right. So going going there, it was an eye opener. Oh, it's more big people out there that's doing it just like me. Yeah, you, it's, it's 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 five of you. 
Yes. It, 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 now they are here at this university. So how do you separate yourself from that person? Well, I'll tell you exactly how to do it. Number one, you put the work in on and off the field. Get in the weight room. Do your classwork. Outwork the next man. If that man do 10 reps, I do 11. So I'm going to make sure I'm always one up on you. So this is what you were doing in the spring as a high school yeah. senior oh, yeah. on a yeah, on a yeah. college campus. So you, was a, yes, you weren't even a real freshman. You was a half of a, a little bit of a freshman. A little bit. I wasn't even ready. I, but <laughs> every, everything that was going on, I was seeing. I was, I, was, I was understanding that I have to outwork this guy in order to play. And there was a guy by the name of Lawrence Pence. To Lawrence Pence is, was Jinx, Oklahoma, top-rated linebacker, this, this, that, whatever, All-American, this, this, and that. Well, I watched him. I watched how he worked. I watched how he did things. And I saw where he was succeeding. I saw where he was failing. So me, I'm a good visual person. I like to people watch. And if I see this is working for you and this ain't working so well, well, I'm going to learn from your mistakes and I'm going to kind of pick up on where you left off. So I trained with him. I made sure that, okay, he's sprinting. He's starting middle linebacker this time. So starting middle line, linebacker only doing 10 sprints. better than that guy because I knew what I was doing. I was trying to outwork one person at a time. And I ended up working out for me pretty well. So, so I just stay with the hard work. So you was uh you was lucky enough to have a, a spring. You you had a spring practice. Yep. You know, so you was able to be a participant in spring. So how did it I mean what I'm I'm a I don't even want I'm a fast forward it. What was that moment in Oklahoma State, as a high school senior on a, on a Division One campus, did you let them know, y'all got to put some respect on my name? First spring practice with pads. I let them know where I'm from. By the hardest hit they ever heard, they heard. By the end of hurting, I started quarterback. <laughs> so you was in the doghouse. <laughs> uh, that's that's where I let them know. It. At the same time, though. You got your good linebacker, you might be missing the quarterback, but you got your good linebacker. <laughs> That's the way I looked at it. But Bobby Reed, my boy, though, I mean, it was a mishap. I mean, I was always taught, if you don't know what you're doing, go find the ball full speed. Yeah. That's what I was always yeah. taught. And I'm a freshman. You know, I'm a freshman, first spring. You have of a freshman. Got... You ain't even a real freshman yeah. right then. Well, see, they, they missed out because they didn't put him in a red jersey. If they put him in a red jersey, they mean stop. Okay? So... You, you you let go of pit bull. You sent me on the blitz, which I don't even think I'm supposed to be blitzing on that play. But I knew it was a blitz, and I didn't know what I was doing, so I just ran to the ball. And he, shit, the hole opened up. He was wide open, get ready to throw the ball, and I laid his ass on the ground, and he fell on the shoulder. And that's Bobby Reed. He's half of a freshman, too. He's an early graduate, too, right? Yeah, he was an early graduate. So both of y'all, both half freshmen on the college yeah. campus. Well, the put Put a little bit more emphasis on that. He's the guy they just they, they five star recruit that just won state for North Shore and supposed to be the starting quarterback going into that next year. So that's how that looked. <laughs> Damn, what I need to talk to Bobby Reed. You need to give me a hold of Bobby Reed. I need to talk to him. You know, I like Bobby Reed. He's one of my favorite players too, uh, coming out back in the day. Oh yeah, me and Bobby was roommates. Bobby, real cool dude, man. Very humble. Very. I mean, he just everything he did, he did with. His own swag, you know. So I hated that that happened to him at the same time, you know, because I knew what he could have been. And then going forward, I don't know if some things shook him up after that going forward. But I mean, he was a lot better person, a lot better athlete than what he. I think he had the chance to show while he was there. So how was that recruiting process? Because most most people doing recruiting like for signing day, right? No, you doing recruiting because I'm ready to go now. So your recruiting was a little bit more intensive. Can you name any of the visits, the big name visits rather that you made? Well, just outside the visits, the reason why I sped up my recruiting is because all the attention I was getting, all the phone calls, all the letters, all the things. So I kind of wanted to die down everything and try to get out, find me school, and just kind of start concentrating on that thing. So, you know, when when – Graduating early became an option. A lot of teams was like, oh, well, they already knew I had the grades. That's why I had a lot of kids, a lot of uh, colleges on me. So when they knew I wanted to graduate early, the, the intensity of the recruiting picked up. Coaches call a little bit more often. The coaches uh, want to come by a little bit more. More recruiting services are calling you, trying to get your story. And thank God that we didn't have, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter back then. 
there's no telling what it been. I don't know what these kids are dealing with when it comes to you know social media recruiting because right. I never had that experience. I had the letters, the phone calls, the visits, and stuff like that. So the best visit, <laughs> the best the, the best visit I took was Oklahoma State. Now, was it the funnest? Probably not the funnest. What was the funnest? Man, <laughs> Arizona State would be the funnest, you know. But that was the number one party school at the time, you know. So you go to Arizona State to party. I mean, you weren't going to get no education. <laughs> so you, you know, I mean, I'm just, I'm just being, at, that, at that time, you know. And they was partying in, in Arizona. Man, that was back just... in 2004, man, they were partying, man. Like, you go to the campus and it's beautiful. You know, but the school is beautiful. I mean, great academics, everything, you know. But at the same time, I'm coming out of high school, and, you know, and you, you going to different, you see the, the party scene a little bit. Yeah, I'm like, wow, this is, this is what it is, you know. So, I mean, that was the funnest one, but the most information that I got was at Oklahoma State towards what I wanted to do for my further, my to further my career in so education was always the constant. You know, most people putting the football ahead of the. Because you know, I was mad at you because you didn't go to UT. You know, I'm a lifelong, lifelong. You know that lifelong, <laughs> Longhorn fan. You know what I'm saying? But I was. So what was the UT thing like? If you if you want to dive into it, what did they say at UT? They make you go the opposite. Because I remember it was UT LSU. I was like, man, either one of them two. We gravy, baby. Purple and gold, or we gonna go hook them. Yeah, Casey Hampton already then left out of there, and then everybody, you know, Casey Hampton was a legend there. He was like guard, you know. I'm like, man, my cousin gonna go play with Vince Young. It's going down. And then you let, broke let, my heart. Let me tell you a story about that, about Casey. And Casey loved Casey, man. Uh, I remember me and Walter was in the weight room, and, you know, Casey Hampton walked in. And we like, oh, Casey, like, What's up, man? Because I, I knew it so weird. Me and Walter was the only one in there. Coach said, uh, Coach, uh, uh, what's that man's name? Vince Moore Schultz? No, the head coach at the time. I'm sorry. I, I, was it Lanier? Y'all had Lanier? Absolutely. Y'all had Holmes, huh? Holmes, oh, there it is. Coach Holmes. He had me and Walt come up, go into the weight room for some reason. The, the whole team was still in the front in the locker room. So we go into the weight room and Casey walked in and he he, he just went straight to the point. He was like, man, y'all want to go to Texas or what? And Walter was like, yeah, I mean, I ain't, you know, walk straight up. I, she, I go, you know what I mean? Me, I said, man, I want to take my business and stuff like that. And he's like, man, look, Texas is where it's at, man. He, tried, he gave it the whole spiel about Texas and I still was like, I still want to take my business. So he like, man, you tripping. <laughs> he <laughs> yeah. Walked out the, he walked out the weight room. And like, Walt looked at me like, bro, what are we going to do? I said, man, I'm going to take my visit. I don't care what nobody saying. That was just me, though. You know, anybody else could do what they wanted to do. You know, but what, what threw a sour to me, though, is, is the pressure that uh, Coach McQuarters, he, he was the one that recruited me from Texas. And um, he, I had a phone conversation with him. And the way it went, is he called me, and he's like, so, have you made a decision where you want to go? And I'm like, nah, because I'm going to take some visits and, and kind of feel my way out and, and see what place best suits me and what's best for my family. He say, all right, now, don't, don't drag your feet too long because there's a linebacker right down the street from you that, that we're interested in. And that pissed me off because I knew exactly what we were talking about. And if anybody knows the rivalry of Galveston Ball and Lamar, high school, then they'll understand that you can't threaten me about recruiting nobody else from that school. Uh, Bobino. Boom, there you go. Hey, this is Thursday, Thursday. We're going to talk about it. We don't hold off no names. That was Bobino. So, what he did was, he didn't know how deep that rivalry was. No, so, he had no idea. who won y'all senior, the Lamarck Ball High game? He won. So, you wasn't going to Texas at all. You wasn't going to play with him at all. That wasn't gonna happen. People don't realize how deep that rivalry is. You was not going to UT to play with with Bobby No. Even though it'd have been a dream, it'd have been a dream linebacker corp. God damn boy, y'all have set G yeah. County on fire. Well, we yeah. wasn't G County back yeah. then. We was just Galveston no, and Lamar. No, it was Galveston. And see, that's what people don't understand. See, now looking looking back at it, yeah, we could have made a, a pipeline there and, and set it off for the county. Right. But you know, 
And this is what people don't understand, that the rivalry was so tough back then that you couldn't go to Lamar and just go hang out because people knew who you was. Right. I come to my grandma's house up here in Lamar because it was, it was like, now nah, you're the, I doubt I'm doing it again. Yeah. <laughs> you're the wrong, wrong turn. Right. Know? So you got you to gotta move around from that. So, you know, when he threatened me with that, I was just more like, oh, you can have it, Lamar. That's just the way I looked at it, you know, and you know, I, I talked to Bomber in those sense, and we played together, and they played against each other, stuff like that. And it's all love. Bomber don't know it's all love. But it's just at that time. <laughs> at that time. <laughs> it was real, man. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I ain't trying to feel that. I, I, you don't put, and they mess around, major. I fight for the same position, you know, yeah. just to get some comp out of the whole thing, you know. And, and the thing is, is when when Bombino committed, it, it didn't phase me one way or other, you know, because I kind of knew it was coming because they they, they needed a commitment, right? And they, they you recruited. I mean, Bombino was a damn good linebacker for the more. What you gonna do? Like, I can go get you the big six foot two, two hundred thirty pound linebacker. I can go get this beaster down there. Probably be about five eleven, but he gonna be on every tackle. So I mean, you couldn't go wrong with either one. It's just what you want to pick, and you know, I let them make their decision. But I was I wasn't gonna rest my decision because they forced it. Right, I was right. trying to force it. Right. So, uh, so less miles. You play for less I'm miles. Correct that. I'm sorry. Not force me, but try to pressure me. Yeah, pressure. You know yeah, saying? yeah. So you had less miles recruited you right when you came in. How was less miles? And what was the difference between Les Miles and Gundy? Les Miles, my dog, man. <laughs> the Mad Hatter, one of the goats. Les, Les Miles, let you know how it is. She gonna tell you how T.I. is, baby. He gonna have it no other way, you know. And that's just he a grinder, he a hard worker. You finna work, you finna. I mean, it was hard, man. Les was a go getter, man. And like you had three hour practices sometimes. It was like, ooh, I'm ready to go. But he gonna get it. He gonna perfect it. You know, we he recruited guys that was girthy. that had some size and some, yeah, same some, thing some, he did at LSU. You seen it? Yeah. Same. That that recipe seems to work, and that's one thing I can say about LSU. Now they didn't get away from that same recruiting style. Oh, the Oklahoma State did, and we'll get to that in a second. But yeah, they got away from that goddamn recipe. But if you go with Les Miles and Mike Gundy and you put the two together, you say, who, who, what coach did you like the most? By, by all means, Mike Gundy. Yeah, I mean, that that guy, he's a player's coach. Man. Talk about me. A, I'm a man. That, that's my dog, <laughs> man. Mike Gundy. I'm a man. So he was more of a uh, a father figure type. He was more of a family oriented. He was, he, he was a guy that was always going to be there. You can go into his office and talk to him at any time. But Les Miles, you had to set an appointment, even for his own players. You had a secretary out there that's less miles in. Oh, well, he won't be back till about 3 o'clock. I'll put you on the schedule for 3. Cool, I'll come back at 3. And with, but with Gundy, you just going to knock on the door. Yeah, answer the door. <laughs> hey, what you want to talk about? Come on, sit down. I remember just going to Mike Gundy off just to talk. Just to sit there and shoot the shit, you know. And But that's how he always was. So when you, you it's a difference when you get from the quarterback coach like he was and office of, well, you can say offensive coordinator, but and then all of a sudden you're thrown into a head coaching position. You can't wear those the same hat you wore last year, so you got to do things that are different. You kick 16 people off the team as soon as he got the job because he had to change the program. Right, right. So most people don't understand that. So one thing that's tolerable for one head coach ain't tolerable for the next head coach. So he made a statement when he did that, and that's when we lost Walter. So, so what made him? What made him keep hold of you? Well, what made him keep hold of me, number, besides football, being athletic and things like that, I took care of my business on and off the field. You know, right. like I came back with Dean's on the roll. You know, so he really didn't have. You made me. Dean's on the roll as a sophomore. As a freshman. As a freshman. As a freshman. Talk so, to him, bro. Right, right. Talk so, to him. I mean, I went to school, man, to, to do what I need to do. I didn't. I used football as a platform. I didn't use football for my life. Right. the platform for me. So that's what I decided that I was going to do with it. I knew I wasn't, you know, the, uh, I knew I had a chance to be, you know, possibly NFL if I kept working at it and things like that. I, I, but I didn't I didn't put all my eggs in that basket. So I wanted to make sure that I had something to put, put behind my name for a paper. And I learned that from you. The more paper you have behind your name, the more, the more powerful you are. Yeah. You ain't got no paper behind your name. You better have some paper because they're going to take that football away. They're going to take that yeah. basketball away, and you can run track all you want. That speed going to leave, too. You better have some paperwork, baby. This here? I'm telling you. 
I'm this year. You. So I want, I, want, I want some letters behind my name, and it better not be HIV. Let me put you. <laughs> Uh, Thirsty Thursday, baby. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. So, do you? What can you remember your first game action at Oklahoma State? What game it yeah. was, and what did you do when you first got in there? Did oh, you yeah. tee up? Oh yeah, my first my first game versus Tulsa. Uh, that was 2004, and my first play was on kickoff. <laughs> so your brother, your brother seen the film. So your brother got the film that like the the whole. The whole thing. So I, you know, you get in this zone where everything just you can't hear nothing but the sound of your heart, and that's all I heard. My heart was just boom, 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 boom. And as I seen the kicker taking off to go kick the ball, it would be faster and faster. As soon as he kicked the ball, that's when I heard the crowd, and I just heard a, a, just a, a glance, of, like a little glimpse of it, and then it went away. I'm running. I'm just a boy left. Avoid right. <laughs> I see this dude. They hold their hands. They you know they can't make the wall no more. Yeah, yeah. They, back then they make that wedge. <laughs> they make that four man wedge. And I I just remember Coach Defoe that wedge pick you one out. Go tear him up. And that's what I did. I picked one out. And the rest is history. He didn't play no more football. Right, right. God. We don't, we don't that. <laughs> okay, we'll leave it. At that. <laughs> so that was your was so that was your first big hit. That was my first play of college football and my very first big hit in college football. So at the linebacker position, what was your biggest hit? Man, I got a couple of them. <laughs> your biggest hit? I'm talking about the one right now. If that dude seeing you, he probably want to fight you. The quarterback from Baylor. Uh, he took off on the screen. He had a scramble. And, uh, which is three deep, middle linebacker going deep third. So as, uh, he sees me dropping to the middle, so he decides not to throw the ball. He decides to tuck and run. Well, again, everything slows down. So I'm watching his steps. I'm watching his moves. And I see him dip across from a block. He dipped right into the wrong shoulder, and he got his ass tattooed. <laughs> uh, so he's fumbled, and balls on the ground. We couldn't recover it, though, but, you know. It was, you murdered him. You I, murdered him. It was probably one of the biggest hits I've had. But I've had, I had a couple now. And it's hard to pick when, when you have a couple of, of favorites and uh, on you, you know. Yeah. So down, the line of, down the line of scrimmage and slid his ass, you know. So, but some... People say big hits is as how it look. Some big hits don't might, might might not look that bad, but they tore that person up. On yeah. Side. I, and like I, I never forget we playing K State and the, I don't know the running back name, but he hit the hole and it, you know it was a it was a, a cluster of people about the first one to hit him. And when I hit him, I could just hear him go. <coughs> you know, like hey, <laughs> that life came out of. Yeah, like like so he was rolling around on the ground. I knocked all the fucking wind out of his ass. So, excuse me on my language for Thirsty Thursday, but that's the only way you can say it at that point. You but. knocked this fucking wind out of Thirsty Thursday. <laughs> Bow! Take that. But you, you go in with it, man. But, you know, I played, I played a reckless style of football, man. So most people, the, style of, the way I play football, you won't make it too long playing that style of football. I just didn't care. I, I didn't have a, uh, I didn't have a care or respect for anybody that was opposite jersey of me. So... So, so going back, uh, you played in a lot of those Big 12 rivalries, right? How did it feel? You got, you know, the OU Texas game. You got Bedlam, you know. Everybody know about Bedlam. Like, how does it, like, what is it like just playing in those games? Is it? Those games are fun. Those games are the ones that you wait all year for. When you're going to go play Texas. This the old Big 12. Yeah, yeah. When you're going to go play Texas, when you're going to go play OU, when you're going to go play teams like that, Missouri, when you're going across there to go play them. I mean, those are the games that people are tuning in and watching. So not only are you have your fans in the stands watching, but you got everybody across the nation watching this game. So you get amped up for it. Right. I mean, those, those have been my biggest games. I mean, I think every OU game I played in, I had double-digit double tackling. So... I mean, when when you level up to those type of competitions, I mean, 
I, I was a guy for the big lights. I wanted, I wanted the light to be on me, and not in a selfish way, but I wanted to make sure that my presence was going to be known. And being the quarterback of the defense, you know, yeah, it, yeah, it's you. You gotta, you gotta make sure that your guys are playing at level that you playing at. So if you, you dragging ass on the field, or you not, you blowing your assignments, or you not doing your job, then everybody's gonna pick up on that. It's gonna be a, 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 a downward spiral or some bad shit happening, but. People ride on the guys they've been seeing doing this shit all year. Not just on the football field on Saturdays or Fridays, whatever you play, but who's doing it in practice? Who's doing it in the weight room? Who's doing it off the field in the film room? Things like that. People ride on those coattails of those people and jump on the back of those people because they can trust them. Right, and right. What, I, was, I was one of those guys that I put in the work off the field and on the field, and so the attitude I had going into the game is the same attitude the defense would have. And I was always pissed off, so I mean, we had a pretty pissed off DC. <laughs> right, right. So, so moving along, so you get to about what your senior year, and then you have a scheme change. Yeah. And a, per, a coaching personnel change. You get a new defensive coordinator, right? Yeah. So you got a scheme change and a position change, you know. But you kept your head up, and you did, you know, you did what you could do. Tell me more about that. I mean, it was hard. When you, when you know you lead the team in tackling for the last two years, you top two, top three in tackling on the team, and then all of a sudden, a new coach from Ohio State, Tim Beckman, comes in, and he's like, well, I think you'll be better at defensive end. Now, to his credit, we had one, two, three defensive ends go down. Two, two of them had surgeries, and one towards the ACL, so they looking at the next big person on the defense like, you it. So I went down there, and, you know, doing tour days. He right. Like, I want it's it's called Leo. The position is Leo. You, all you have to do is stand up, contain the edge, and blase, blase. So I'm like, cool. I'm standing up, just like this. How he pitched it to me. It's just like linebacker. You're standing up, you run around, make a play. Just don't let anybody get outside of you. I'm like, cool. I can do that. So I make the transition, and of course I'm a team player. And so, like, if, if we hurt in here, okay, this is what you need me, throw me there. This is what the same thing we did about high. Throw you in the fire. Right. So, I, I mean, you throw me a defensive end, and everything's great until you tell me, okay, on this package, I need you to put your hand down. What? I can't see. And that was my biggest complaint. I can't see. I right. never played with my hand in the ground. So, I mean, it, it, was, it was quite a transition. And, you know, you're trying to transition to this new position quickly. I don't know. I don't even know all the defensive schemes down in the trenches because I mean, remember he's new, so I'm still learning a whole new defense too. So on top of that, I wasn't playing fast anymore. My level of playing has slowed down because now I have a learning curve and a new position to learn. So I mean, it was hard. It really was. And the people that never made a transition that quickly at that type of level wouldn't uh -huh. understand. It takes special people and. and the, I, I was very good at what I did, but it takes special people to be able to make transitions, seamless transition to new positions in the middle, of, like right before a season starts. So, I mean, it, it was hard. It did not go over well. I did not like playing defensive end. Uh, I have mad respect for people that play in the trenches all day, all night, fighting down there with them big boys, but that wasn't the life for me. But eventually you ended up getting moved back to middle linebacker. Yeah. I mean, once he once – I hate to say it this way, but once he got tired of getting the ball ran up the middle and some choice words by me and having a conversation with Coach Gundy, I was like, look, I need to go back to my regular position. Like, this is my, my uh, position coach, Todd Bradford. He was eager to get me back. He was eager because he did not want to let me go down deep in the end, but at the same time, he understood we needed help down there. So, you know, when they made the transition, I made I transitioned back for Texas a and &M. I didn't play Texas in them game because I was transitioning back, and I was mad. I'm talking about that's the first game I never played in. Right. First game since the, so I didn't play that game. So the next game we played against Texas, so uh, I had some some turned up to do. So I turned up that game, and he finally seen that he made a mistake. And the final game we played that year was uh, against OU. I mean, I had 17 tackles, and then he comes to me and he admits after that that game that maybe he made a mistake through the season. He should have left me in my my position. And that potentially I, costed you millions of dollars. Oh, yeah. Not not potentially. It did. It, that, that was the thing that hurt me the most going forward, going to the NFL, that I had a transit. I didn't have as good as a year I had previously. My junior year, if I came out, I was projected to at least be third round, second, third round, you know. 
But when you when I say, okay, well, then if I project to do this, then if I stay and I have another good year, then my thinking was, you know, stay, have another good year, and you can boost your, your draft status, you know. So you could have left your junior year and entered the draft. I could have, but it wasn't a for sure thing. It was just a lot of he say, she say, this agent is thinking this, this thing, please say. So it wasn't a for sure thing. So you, you you don't know what to do at that time period. You just know what's best for you. Right. So for my my choice was just to stay in school and work at it again. Now guys, that if I would have been an All American coming out or something like that, or won some awards, or things, I would have came out. You know, would have definitely came out. But not having that guarantee, that made me choose education over you know trying to go make some money. So that and that gets to the big question that everybody been waiting on. So. So we're going through the draft process, right? And I remember me and you, we sitting on the couch, it's draft day, right? And uh and, and, and the whole draft go by, we 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 sat through what was what three days? Day one, two, two days. We sat through the whole draft, me and you on the couch, and your name didn't get called, right? Right. And then afterwards, you know, you get the uh you get the free agent call. Right. Right. To go to uh, the the Jets, right? Yes, sir. So, how did that feel? Like, what was that like when you uh, when you went to the Jets? Well, it was disappointing because at the same time, people, uh, I didn't understand the draft process. I didn't understand what happened. So I had an agent that was not not up on current things going on. So, although I got a call in the fifth and the sixth round. Nobody was there to pick up a, a phone call. You know, the agent's not at the office, and you got the wrong number written down for the office. So it's like, call me. You know, like they should have. They called my agent trying to get in touch with me, but they had no number. So by the time they get a number for me, it's like draft over. They got me a free agent now, and that's that's the process that that was most sickening. Is that I didn't even know this at the time. You know that that I thought that was just me fell to the that you know as a free agent, but. He didn't do his job. And when I went up to New York and had some other things happen, uh, it just things didn't progress the way it was supposed to progress. Some you got to watch who you put in your life. You got to watch who you put in the, in the position to manage your everyday life. Of course, when it comes to you making that kind of money, and I just didn't. I, I didn't pay attention to a lot of things I should have paid attention to, and it bit me in my ass, you know. But everything happened for a reason, you know. Uh, my lifestyle that I have now was always going to be there for me. That was the right. style I wanted, being a coach. I knew I was going to be a coach. I knew this from day one. You know, it just, it took some learning, some growth, some experience to come back and be able to teach. And that's what I'm most proud of is that I was able to go out there and get that experience, able to see certain things, learn certain things, and be able to bring that back to my community and back to our, our youth and our community and be able to pass that information. So with the with the Jets, when you were with the Jets, and that was the year uh, Kellen Winslow Jr. got hurt, so they had to pick between. All right, we short at the line, we short at the uh, at the tight end, and we have one more linebacker than we need. You were the new man in, right? And due to the roster cuts, they had to let you go. So after that, what, what happened? Well, the way that worked out is that I got called into the office. And Coach Mangini, he sat me down. And he start, and this is why I knew the, 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 the whole meeting was going to go left. It's when he started off with everything good. Man, I must say, I love the way you come in with the intensity, the, the fire you have, the way you run around and, and you participate in the practice field and all. He glowed me up a little bit. Then all of a sudden, he came to the bombshell. But I'm so sorry to say that, you know, unfortunately – do the numbers, we are short tight ends and we have to sign a tight end at this moment. We do not have a space to sign another linebacker. So they sent me home. You know, you send a send a brother home and I'm thinking that I wasn't good enough no more. Then you get a phone call back. Now this is the part that, that hurt the most. You get a phone call back to say that they're they're possibly well, from the agent at the time, they're possibly looking to sign you again. So just stay by your phone. And you stand by your phone and you wait that whole day for that phone call, you never get that phone call ever again. And it's like, damn, is it over? Right. You know? 
So you you enrolled back in the school to finish to get your uh, degree in. Uh, what was your degree in education, right? Yes, sir. In that May, I mean that January, I decided to go back to school and enroll. Because, so uh, so tell them about that process. How did you? What did you have to do to get back in I'm school? Sorry, August, not January. It was August. Well, um, what I did was, <laughs> and this for the kids out there, the way you treat people. And the good stand that you stay with people is going to determine a lot of things for what people are going to do for you. And when I left Oklahoma State because I had the opportunity to go pro, I did not leave on good terms with people. I did not leave on good terms with the academic part of it because I, I took off and took advantage of a situation that I shouldn't take advantage of. What they do is they pay you for summer school. So you're going to be there for summer school, they're going to pay you for it. Well, what I did is I said I was going to be there for, I'm going to take summer courses online. But I was going to go train for the NFL. And they agreed to it, and I said, cool. So when they paid me my money, it was about uh, two days before I had to leave for my training. They paid me, and I dropped my courses the next day, all my classes. So I pretty much got paid, and I didn't take summer school. And I stayed up there, and I did the whole deal. So when it came time for me to come back to school, the financial advisor, I mean, the uh uh, academic advisor would not approve it. She she wasn't having that. She said the way you left, the disrespect, you didn't answer nobody's phone call, this, this, and that. Why should we help you now? And I was just like, because I'm trying to get to school, blah, 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 blah. I gave this whole sob story. And she looked me, i never forget Mr. Gatham. She looked me square in my face. She said, baby, you falling on death ears. You can go tell somebody else that story. And I walked out of the office just like that. And I had no degree to fall back on. I had no football, no degree. So I'm sitting in my my friend's house thinking about what I just what kind of predicament I just put myself in, and um, the next day I got the courage to go right back up there and talk to the same lady that just turned me away from my office, and I begged them like please just please and all she had to do was put a name on this piece of paper, piece of paper so I could take it down to the register and register, it, and she wouldn't sign it. So um, I'm leaving the building again discouraged, and I I remember uh, this lady named by Miss Middlebrook. Uh, she's the head academic advisor. So um, I could not get a meeting with her because she was not there. So when I was leaving the building, I happened to see her walking in, and I spoke to her. And she spoke to me, and she came up to me, and we talked for a little bit, and she asked me what I was doing back, and I told her. Trying to get back in school, she said, well, come to my office. So, and this is the Miss Agatha, this is her boss. So as I'm walking back into the building, past Miss Agatha's office, Miss Agatha looking at me like, with the eyes of fuck you on it. And so I go to the back and I'm talking to her, she, and uh, Miss Middlebrook, she sit me down, she let me know exactly what happened. She said, well, you know, people are upset at the way you left the school. You didn't pretty much say bye, didn't do anything. You took money and you ran, this, this, and that. And I agreed, I said, I was wrong, this, this, and that. I, I had, I had a lot of remorse for what I've done. So she said, I'm going to give you one chance. If you can convince this guy, i sign the paper. So she sent me to the president of the university. I had to go talk to the president of the university. I had to write a one-page letter to the president of the university of why they should admit me back into the school. So I did. So I went to go have this meeting with the president, and um, uh, he looked at me and said, hey, he knows me, Coach Holger. Holger. I've been knowing him since I've been there, and he, and he used to be the head wrestling coach, but now he just became the AD. So he looked at me and said, man, what are you doing? Like, why would you do something like that? And I just broke it down to him exactly what I was feeling at that time and the pressure I was feeling, and I just wanted to make sure that I had money for when I left and stuff like that. And he understood. He said, you know, I'm trusting you, but the first thing you're going to do is pay for your own school. We'll reimburse you afterwards. So that's what I did. I got me a job at Pizza Hut. I drove some pieces around, man. And I paid for my own school for a semester until they reimbursed me afterwards. That's a humbling thing right there. Start. How many times did you get, oh, man, that's Roger Johnson. <laughs> the most humbling thing is when, and people don't understand this, dog, but it was a, uh, it was a OSU basketball game going on. And it's a busy day at work. I mean, he's just flying out to out the goddamn store, so he called me in to work that day, and I'm like, fuck, I ain't putting that piece of her sound on my car. People know my car. I'm not putting it on my car. So he ain't make me put it on my car, but I still had to go deliver the shit. So I'm delivering this pizza, and I go to the little dorms where I normally used to party and stuff like that. 
and I knock on this door. And they open the door, and the dude's like, jaw drop, everything. He's like, Roderick Johnson? I'm like, yeah, man, 1552. <laughs> 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 yeah, man, 1552, dog. Give him money. He's saying, oh, shit. This fucking shit. It's Roderick Johnson. So all the roommates came out the door and everything. The dude... This dude had on my in my not my NFL jersey, my, my college jersey with the number two on it. He wanted to sign it, so I signed it. They watching the game. I sit down, I had a couple slices of pizza with him, drunk a beer with him and all kind of shit, just watching the game with him for a little bit. And then when I left that apartment, it was about like 10 minutes. When I left the apartment, I went back to my job and I said, I can't do no more deliveries. What happened? Too many people know me out there, man. It, but it was humbling because, you know, these guys just seen me play last season previous season on the gridiron, you know, and now I'm delivering a pizza to your to your house. So lifestyle can change like that. And they of course they don't know what I'm doing. I'm trying to pay for my school right now. So right. I fucked up. So I'm trying to pay for my school. But I mean that reputation of what you was and what you are now is a stigma that athletes deal with a lot. That's why you see a lot of athletes like after playing football, they don't know what to do with themselves. They end up getting on drugs getting in trouble, being sick, dead, because you're no longer in that spotlight that you was used to being in, and now people are looking at you differently, and you don't know how to handle that situation. So you get the so you get the magical call back to the NFL. By who who calls you? I can't remember. Was it the Bears or the Ravens? Who which no, one? Baltimore. Baltimore Ravens to go play with Ray Lewis, and you had to make a decision. The stand school. <laughs> or uh, go play some more football. <laughs> go play some football. And, and and what decision you make? And this is what the kids don't understand. I, I, although I, I gave myself an opportunity to go make some money and not finish my degree. And it failed. It backfired on me. So that time around, I stayed my black ass in school and got my degree. And so from there, I got black ball from the NFL because I turned down my, my opportunity. I didn't completely turn it down. I said, no, thank you. I'm in school. Are you serious right now? Like, I'm 100% sure that I'm not going to play football this year. And I have my last phone call I ever got. Now I got phone calls from, like, Arena Leagues and CFL. I did go do CFL now, but it wasn't, it's not the same level of football, so it's not the same passion for it. No right, so right, right. It was done for me. Well, I can say that you, you, you made a safe decision, and you had a child at that time, didn't you? Well, right after I finished playing, I had a baby. I, I had my first son. Don't throw no babies on me. I had my first son. I had my son. I say first son. I didn't have my son until I was 26. Okay, okay. Well, I'm going to tell you this. You made a safe decision because, just, I mean, you see how all it took was an injury. You know, yeah. and, I mean, if that injury don't happen, because Kellen Winslow was they top tight end. If that injury don't happen, who knows what the hell we doing right now? You probably didn't gave me that million dollars you said you was gonna give me and everything, but I would pay for the rims that you gave me. That I, I left to get rested in the storm. Man, you still owe me some money too, man. You need to come on with my little old change, man. Hey, man, you need to come on with my little old change. But look, hey, what that jersey that I gave? That ain't worth the rims. That ain't even. Bruh, that jersey still worth I got that jersey. It's put up in the storage. I got that jersey signed by Roger Johnson. But I want I want you to tell this story because I wanted kids to see. Because you know they all see you now. You got a, a nice coaching career. You didn't coach college. You back down here in the county. Thank God you in Texas City coaching at that high school. You didn't coach at Ball High. Uh, you coached at uh, uh, Web City. Bay City, uh, Madison, Madison, Houston, Madison. Like uh, a, a nice coaching career you put together, and it was all the product of that degree that you was able Southern to obtain. Arkansas and that was something, huh? Southern Arkansas. Yeah, Southern, Southern Arkansas University, and now you're down here in Texas City High School. And 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 I, I won't, you made a safe decision, and you made a good decision for the simple fact it wasn't no more. I mean, what you was gonna do if they'd have cut you again, or somebody else would have got injured? What would have happened? I, I wouldn't have had a degree. I wouldn't be in my profession now, man. And, and, and who knows where you'll be? And you'll be just like those those athletes you spoke of earlier. So, man, I, I just want you to get your message out, get your story out, and it's a hell of a story, great story. You know, I rode with you the whole time, and and that's why I wanted to have you on, man. And I, and I appreciate you for coming on. To the Thursday Thursday, no excuses podcast. You know how we do it, right, right.
let me let me say this one thing before we get off this this broadcast though. If you got the opportunity to make millions of dollars, okay, I want to make this very clear. You got the opportunity to make millions of dollars, or for show sure million, like you was number one draft pick, something like that. You take your money and you go get your money. But that's the way I feel. About Soon it. as you probably should have left yeah. your junior year. Yeah. You get you get an opportunity to go make your money, make your money. But number one thing though is your degree. Never forget your degree, man. That paper just it opens so many doors for you, man. So and on on the topic, yeah, if I had an opportunity and I've been a bona fide first round pick or something like that, I'm gonna go make my money. But I think most of the kids out there these days they need to understand how important that paper is behind your name. Already, man. So man, this is Roger Johnson. Coach Roderick Johnson, I, I call him Ra Ra. That, that's a family thing, you know what I'm saying? Y'all can't call him Ra Ra. But I appreciate you coming on, man. Push your head to a white beat. Hey, Thursday, Thursday, baby. We in this thing. We doing it how we doing it, man. Appreciate you, Kemp, for coming through, man. And like I say, we G County all day. I got to get my hat right here. We G County all day. We gonna rip it like we step it. You know what I'm saying? And gals in Texas, shout out to gals in Texas. Shout out to OSU. We still hook them though. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> man, thank you, uh, Ken, for coming through here, blessing our game, man. It's a good interview, man. A good message, man. I hope I hope you pass this message on. I hope somebody else hears this message. And, and, and understand, you know, what's going on out here. And everybody think they can go pro. And everybody think that's, you know, that's the only thing to do. Everybody think football or sports of anything is if they ain't doing that, they ain't nothing. And you're a prime example of you never let football take priority over your life. And nah, and, and you all right because of that, man. And let me get that orange jersey because you gave me the white one. It got grass stains in it still. Yeah, you want that one? You can't get that one, Kiffa. I'm sorry. Well, let me borrow that helmet. Uh, you can, yeah, that, that helmet, you can get that. All right, I'm coming by there and get it right now after we get out of quarantine. All right, and, yeah. hey, this the reason why we had to, we had to do it like this because, uh, you know, we're under quarantine right now. We don't want to get no $1,000 fine. So, shout out to my Kim folk for bringing it to us. We're going to get the job done. We're going to always be on time. Thursday, Thursday, man, you got something you want to say right, right before we get up out of here? Man, I just had a good time, man. Make sure you have it back when you need to discuss something else, man. Just have it back on your podcast. Oh, it's going down, man. You know, we're going to talk about it. That's our slogan. We're going to talk about it, baby. Man, get, shout out to all my peeps in G County, man. We keep showing love, keep doing what we do. We're going to rise all together, baby. All ready, man. Ready, man. Thursday, Thursday, man. We out. Never enough. I get a rush. I got to get the move. Inhale, exhale, pull my feet in low. Never enough, I get a rush, I gotta get it.